Welcome to Garage Talks. We uh, decided to stick around at Sports Garage and we ran into Max Chance. Yep. It's world champ single speed cyclocross. You currently are the world champion. Yep. When, and that was last year in where was that? Utah? That was St. George, Utah in before Thanksgiving, whenever that is, mid November. <laughs> okay. It all runs together now. Right? It's so, COVID, it's all. I was joking, like, now that we've been locked in our house, I've been at my house sleeping in my bed longer than I have ever been in that house up to that date. Like I travel so much on the road and with cross that I haven't spent this many nights in my own bed since moving into our house in August of last year. Oh, so man. it like feels weird because <laughs> I'm like, now I'm home all the time. Right. So, well, we kind of crossed paths recently. You sent me an email about a, uh, an event that you were doing to help Boulder families. Um, before we get into learning more about you, talk about that event, because that's kind of why we ended up being here. Totally, yeah. So me, should I look, I got a question. Should I look at the cameras or no? No, we can talk okay, and okay. you can look a little bit. Got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, me, you know, everything's been canceled and everything's in limbo now. We don't know if we're going to have a cross season. There's no gravel races and all this stuff. And so also everyone's suffering right now with the unemployment numbers and all that stuff. So uh, I co-own the blue stage racing team with eric bruner and grant holicky and so we came up i was actually camping during the time that they came up with this idea <laughs> but i came down to service and found out that we're doing a 200 kilometer charity ride next weekend and it was like yeah great idea so we're trying to raise five grand for effa which is emergency family assistance association so they provide meals and food and stuff to families around boulder they've been they've been doing it for over a hundred years oh wow so yeah and ironically so i grew up in boulder I grew up by mg fine park and that's where their old uh their old headquarters used to be and okay. so effa's sign is like the first sign i remember like remembering as a kid if that makes sense you know you like drive past it so many times that it's like oh what is what is that? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So it was just ironic how these things like come together. But yeah, so we did 200 kilometers each for to try to raise money. Grant did it on Zwift. And then for every $10 over three grand that we raised to try to get people to donate more money, we had him uh, add a pound to his Zwift rate. And at the end, I think he had just decided to up his weight to the number of donations we had, which I think he was doing like, he's riding like 400 and something pounds, like 450 <laughs> or something. He was doing like 250 watts up a climb doing three miles an hour. Oh, really? At the end of a 10 and a half hour ride on the trainer. That's so just cool. Just in the middle of nowhere. Like he's up in Montana right now, just sitting there in a field. So, so he had to set up Zwift, just for those that may not know. So his avatar is based on his weight and his wattage, yeah. and it moves in an algorithm based on that. So he mm -hmm. had to, he was way heavier. He was way heavier. I think he started at like 280 pounds ish. And Which how much is, does he weigh now? He's probably 160? Yeah, he's probably, no, Grant's a big dude. He's he is probably a big like 190. Guy. Okay. So it's still, I mean, I'm sure Grant's going to see this and talk shit about how <laughs> I don't know what, he's going to be like, I'm much lighter than that. But yeah, so he had fun. And then Eric was trying to Everest. And unfortunately, because of the heat and the, there was like an air quality warning that day. Oh. He, uh, he like couldn't breathe after 11 Where did miles. he do that? He was going to do it on Flagstaff. That's so. right. How many, how much did he do? So he made it 11 of the 14 and a half laps that you have to do. And then he like, he couldn't breathe. So I just drove flags out today. I mean, yeah. I've ridden it too. That's pretty steep. So I did it. I did a couple laps with Ruth when she did it. And I, you know, Superfly is really steep. I don't know why you would voluntarily do it, but I went up there and I was like, why are you guys, this is so hard. <laughs> this sounds miserable. Right. But it's the hip thing to do right now. It it's is. Everesting. I know. So, and then I did my 200K at Marshall Mesa, which is a local trail down in South Boulder, uh, 40 laps of a 5K circuit, so. Which, we, we talked about that on the phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's single track, there's people, and it could have yeah. been, it had to be a little bit challenging to navigate. It was definitely like the first, I, was, I started at six, and I was hoping to get like a couple laps banged out real quick before there was a lot of people out, but I didn't realize that all the cows were out in oh. the morning, and they apparently don't, move on they like the trail a lot when no one's there okay and so for the first hour i was just like i just had to stop every lap and like walk through the field to get around all these like hundreds of cows really yeah oh it was so annoying <laughs> and like they don't care like they don't move and i'm i've yeah i've just was like trying to get 
some laps banged out before a lot of people showed up and it was like, this is even worse. So pro tip, don't ride Marshall Mesa early. Yes, let the people clear <laughs> out unless you wanna hang out with the cows. And I'm kind of terrified of cows and I always, because they're so big and dumb and I just like feel like they're gonna do something stupid. Right. You know, so I don't trust them. And so it was like kind of annoying to be riding behind them and in between them and stuff. So, but once the cows cleared out, the people were all super nice. And I was trying to be really friendly because I knew that I was doing like 14 minute laps ish. And if you're hiking, that means that you're going to see me a lot. Right. Like, I think I saw this one group of high schoolers like 10 times. Yeah, so, that's cool. Yeah, so it was good. So let's back up a little bit. You, I like your tan line. They're about yep. like mine. We, we all seem to have them right now. Um, Fe- so what were you doing like February? What was lo- what was your year like in your head in February? Yeah, so coming off of nationals, uh, coming off of cross nationals in December, I took some time off, took like three weeks off, and then was starting to build back up. And we wildlife generations having a team camp out in uh, California. So that's the TV right? That's your that's the road team. Yeah, that's your road team, which was Jelly Belly, correct? Two years ago. Yeah. Okay. And now it's- wildlife generation. So trying to spread awareness of like protecting the animals and getting back in touch with nature and not like losing sight of the natural habitats that we have. And one of the big pushes right now is protecting mountain lions in the California area. Protecting mountain lions. Yeah. Interesting. Because they're like an endangered species. They're also a keystone species just because they kill a lot of the things that need to be kept in check. And so they're just really good for the environment there. So that's one of the big pushes from our sponsor. Hmm. And so we're having a, we are supposed to have a team camp in, mid end of february sometime and i had uh built the back of i have like 99 tacoma that i just gotten and bu- built a bed in the back and decided to go on this big month and a half road trip that ended up team camp and was in santa cruz and down in la for a while and so i was just training a lot riding in the nice weather like had crazy tan lines already in february and yeah was super fit ready to go to japan and okay. then uh coronavirus hit and haven't left my house since. So, what were you doing? What were you going to Japan for? Uh, we do a lot of racing in Asia with the team. So oh. there's a lot of UCI racing and a lot of good money and stuff over there. And it's super fun to like part. One of my favorite parts about bike racing is like going and seeing other cultures and it's like a good excuse to travel. So it, not, there's no Olympic in the cyclocross, correct? No, no, no. Uh, where you, is that Olympics? I'm thinking of Japan or the Olympics. So Japan has like its own, it's not part of the Olympics. It's but we think like of the Olympics someday for racing? Uh, not really. No, not really, but okay. It's, I mean, it's definitely on the radar, but I think that not, it just depends on the course every year. Like this year is super climbing and stuff. And okay. There's a lot of super strong Americans in the world tour and stuff that would be probably more, I'm more focused on like the domestic scene and nationals and stuff. But Japan, you don't hear about Japan as a cycling. It's crazy because you don't, but they love cycling. Like we were there for Japan Cup, which is the only world tour level race. So like on the roadside things, there's there's races that like world tour teams can go to and those are considered HC events. And then, so that's like the highest distinguished designation of a race that amateur amateur professional teams can go to. Okay. And so we were racing Japan Cup, which is a, 120 miles on a circuit outside of uh, Tokyo, and we're racing against Robert Hessink, the Lotto team, Sven Kreiswijk was there, Baku Moloma, like uh, Mike Woods is there, There's a bunch of world, world tour teams and pro continental teams and stuff. And it was like, I've done tour of Utah, I've done co- tour of Colorado and stuff, and nationals, and I did, I've been to worlds a couple times on the cross bike, and this is, the fans in Japan are insane. Really? It's crazy. I had it's no so, idea. Yeah, they're so into cycling. Did you know, Kenny? I knew about China. Yeah? China, but ch- so China is a little weird because I've been to China a lot too. And China almost feels like they're forced to be there. Huh. Which is like, there are fans, but like the Jap- the, like the Chinese people, it's kind of, it almost feels more like they're excited that like you're there and like, you, like as a white person almost. And like, it's like a new experience for them. So like they'll have... Hmm. I don't think it's because I'm a cyclist because they don't know who I am, but they'll like have, they'll like hand me their children and like have me take pictures with their babies <laughs> and they just want to like take a photo of you. But in Japan, like they had, we're probably, we were definitely one of the lowest rung teams that was at the race. Okay. And we were at, but everyone's staying in the hotel room, same hotel. And there's mobs of fans outside the hotel room at all times. And so you're like going in the back door and we're going in the back door and they have a printout of me from when I won collegiate, cro- collegiate cross nationals. 
in like, that must have been 2016, 2017. Yeah. I, just a picture, had me sign one picture and gave me a picture for my, for, to give to my mom. I was like, <laughs> she's seen the picture. <laughs> You know, and like after the race, you're selling your team kit, selling helmets to people. Really? So we were like, me and one of my teammates, since it was the last race of the year, we stayed in Tokyo for a week afterwards and we we're just selling our team kit for beer money. Oh, that's so funny. So we made like, I think we made a hundred bucks US, like selling some of the old kit. And like I sold the, the, uh, the kit I raced in, still had the numbers on it and like had gel stains in the pocket. What do you suppose they do with it? I, it's just like, a, <laughs> you know. It's, I don't want to wear your kit after you've been I racing. I mean, it's like part of that thing is like just... The memorabilia and like yeah, the, cause yeah. they have, they have other races in Japan, but this is like the big, this is like their tour of California. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's like all the big stars come all yeah. like there's, and there's a lot of like Japanese sponsors and stuff for the teams. And so okay. like lo, one of my friends, Sep Koos is on Lotto and, uh, and El Yumbo. And so they're sponsored by Bianchi, mm. which is, has a big presence in Japan. So they were there for a couple of days afterwards, going to the factory and like doing rides with people. And so it's impressive how. Yeah, you wouldn't think about it, but they're a huge, huge into cycling over there. No kidding. So you're 25, 24? 24, 24, yeah. 24, okay. So you, where is that, where are you at in your career as opposed to where you thought you would like to be or what are some of that, what's that aspiration like? Totally. It's, I don't know. I don't give it much thought. It's interesting because I feel like I, for better or worse, psych, like for everyone knows the cycling world and racing is on tough times now and there's not a ton of teams and uh, not a ton of even before the whole virus and stuff like there's races canceled like tour of california canceled. tour of california is canceled and like tour of california going world tour prevented smaller u.s teams from going and stuff and so i definitely feel like i'm in a weird lull in the cycling world where like five ten years ago back when the scene is thriving maybe it's a little different but right now i'm i feel very grateful to be on a team be on a professional team and because I think now there's three continental teams in the U.S. still. That's just, two, just three. Yeah. There's like, maybe there's four, wow. but there's not many. That's interesting. And a couple of them are, uh, a couple of them are U23 only. So. Okay. Yeah. So huh. it's like pretty much like Wildlife Generation and Elevate KHS are sort of the two real, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, but. Yeah. I wow. think Skyline is a team this year now. But education so. first. So, but so the way road works is there's continental, which is the lowest oh, of the pro okay. professionals, and then there's pro continental, and then world tour teams. Okay. And so pro con continental is like the bottom of the heap, and it's not really like you can't do the like the world tour races. So, so you it's can like double A, triple A, major. Exactly. Like, so it's okay. like you can still, but it's weird because you can still race against the people who are on world tour teams, but just only at certain races. Okay. So it doesn't make it. It's a whole convoluted system. It is yeah. weird because I noticed when like when the Pro Challenge was here, you yeah. had some World Tour teams, a couple, yeah. and you had like the three hundred three project, exactly. which you were on that team. Yep. Which was a is that a Pro Continental or Continental? Continental. Continental. So Continental is like a step above amateur, and there's no. A lot of times people are racing for free. There's no minimum salaries. There's not. It's not like a glamorous thing, but okay. it's still like you're racing in the professional field. You're doing Tour of Utah. You're go into nationals and stuff and so but it's definitely like the low lower rung of the levels so when when was it in your life that you decided you wanted to be a pro cyclist it's weird because it like kind of happened by accident because i i mean i grew up in boulder right, right. and i grew up riding bikes and grew up racing and i had gotten i so i started racing with bjc on the cross bike and had two really really good buddies who lived near me and we just go ride all the time and we wouldn't really train. We'd just go like mess around on our bikes. And then I got pretty good at cross because I had a lot of technical skills and stuff, but no real engine. And so I was like, all right, road's pretty dumb. <laughs> like this cycle cross thing is really fun. And then I, I got on the podium at nationals when I was 15, 16, and I was 16, signed with the cliff bar development team for the next year and was like, well, it's all in like, going to world cups, going to world championships and stuff on the cross bike. And it was definitely like the dream was to go professional in cross, which is like right now there's like two professional teams in the side cross scene domestically. So okay. it's been like, it's been a tough time to, to race there, but, uh, so I've been racing cross for a couple of years and was racing collegiately with CU 
and just through the grapevine, one of my buddies who raced for the 303 Project was also on the CU, CSU team, and they needed a guest rider at uh, Nature Valley, or what is it called now? Forget. But uh, it's North Star is what it's called now. Okay. It's up in Minneapolis. Okay. Five day race, and they needed a guest rider, and I was a cat two at the time, and you're supposed to be a one. They were still a domestic elite team, and so I like called USA Cycling. And I was like, hey, I got no upgrade points, and like, but I'm kind of I'm like went to Worlds for Cross. Like, can you help me get my <laughs> upgrade? And so it was like N- North Star was my first race as a as a pro- professional, pro- first it. professional race, and I was like, I was terrified. I was like, I'm gonna get shelled. I'm gonna get <laughs> dropped so bad. And then um, it ended up having a pretty good race and was, I was the second, I think I finished like 11th overall oh. and was like the second best, second best amateur and second best under 23 rider. So super sick. And they're like, yo, come back for, come back to nationals with us. Like, let's do all these stuff. And I was like, guys, you gotta chill. I got some world cups coming up in like a month and a Cause half. Cause your love is really second Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I've definitely switched once I started racing with 303 Project and I was getting to do like Tour of Colorado and all these other bigger races, then signed with Wildlife Generation, this, the focus has switched more to road. Like last year I was racing, like we finished the season in Japan on the road in October 20th, which is the, you miss a healthy amount of the cross season if you're racing that late on the right. road. Yeah. So I think I only traveled to three cross races last year. So what's your strength on, the, on these teams? Um, I'm definitely like a, a really, like I have a solid sprint, but definitely like a helper on the team is my general role and like trying to get the guys organized. And for the most part, it's been helping other riders out, but I really like the like punchier, hillier races that are long and just arduous. Are you a climber? Not really. Not, yeah. So more just like a all arounder kind of okay. racer. I think the, I think team cycling, the, the aspect of the team and cycling is a pretty pretty unknown yeah. quantity for particularly the most public but even it's there's just a lot of things about it that I don't think people understand yeah it's 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 definitely a weird sport because it is a heavily heavily team sport except that like only one person wins and usually like i finish way off the back but it's like it doesn't matter because like for me the finish line isn't the finish line like for me the finish line is getting my leader to the bottom of the climb in top 5 top 10 you so, know so if you're having a day like you yeah. sound like you kind of had a day when t- with your first time at 303 project totally yeah yeah how did how did that switch so that you could continue to have a day and not get pushed back to be helping yeah i mean it definitely like every, the team captain says all right it looks like you're doing good today so you, we have like director sportifs and stuff who will be in the car and stuff and they've studied the course profile and know rider strengths and stuff and so usually you'll go in with a plan and that's the the plan you stick to and unless like someone's on a really good day or someone makes it to the end of the group so like at at tour of heel last year the second day is the interloop stage and it's got two short climbs at the beginning that rolls through the valley and finishes with a sprint and it was a super good day for me and i was feeling really good and we were riding all in for me in the finish but unfortunately i uh just overlapped some wheels with like 2k to go and was on the ground mm. with one of my other teammates so you know, all best laid plans can be gone and pretty quick. So, but like at, like at Japan cup, I was the team's only finisher and, uh, it was, it was definitely like we were working for someone else, but then all of a sudden it was like pretty clear that I was on a really good day and that the other rest of the guys weren't. And so it was like, all right, like just keep trying to survive over the climb with all these fucking dudes who just got third <laughs> of the tour. Right. So, and it, was, it ended up being pretty good. I was, in the top 30 so happy with it but um yeah it depends on the day and depends on who you've got on the team obviously and stuff so well let's back up to uh, let's say you're 12 years old okay just out of sixth grade yep summertime what else did you like to do uh i was a big big swimmer ironically i don't i was a big swimmer like i grew up right by the base of the mountain so Spent a lot of time out, so outside, a lot of time swimming. I played soccer a bunch as a kid. And then sort of in middle school, I, my mom forced me to, she, told, I, she forced me to quit racing or uh, soccer because I was like going to a sort of like a smarter, smarter middle school, okay. like a charter school and it's supposed to be really, really hard. And she's like, the, the traveling team with soccer is gonna be too much. 
and I was swimming and, and, and started cycling a little bit at the time. And so I was like, but I was, I, was, I really liked swimming a lot. Okay. And I did summer league swimming and stuff. And then my mom's like, all right, no, nope, too much. Can't do swim practice and bike practice because I would go like from bike practice to swim practice and then ride home. She's like, you gotta pick one. And I had some good friends who were on bikes at the time and thought it was super fun. And so it would just be like, summer's up. We would just go meet up, go ride, do some stupid loop and then get Chipotle and hang out of the creek at the end. And it was just fun. It was just like, just a lot of fun with like two of my good friends who I'm still good friends with at the today and just riding around Boulder and finding new loops and like I learned how to bunny hop up the Belgian steps at Belmont like on my road bike because we were bored one day and so it was just just that like cycling was just what I did to go have fun with my friends because it feels like Boulder if you grew up in I don't know middle of Fort Morgan yeah you probably wouldn't have been in bikes I definitely would not have been in bikes I mean Boulder just really was yeah really gave you that and my mom my mom too is definitely like she she's done iron man she's big runner she's 60 now and still rides her age every year in like march which is insane like she's one of the fittest people i know and i think that had a lot to do with the endurance sports side of how it ended up like my brother both my brothers ride bikes and one of them's a big climber and stuff now and you know we there was a high emphasis on outdoors and like being in the woods and going camping and stuff and going mountain biking and all of that stuff. Like when we, when we were, when I was a kid, we had a, ta we had a tandem with a double tag long and a burly <laughs> that we would like ride around the Boulder bike paths. Like that's like 30 feet long. Yeah. Right. Like it's a menace. And so like riding bikes and commuting. And even when I was swimming and I wasn't riding bikes, like I'd ride to swim practice and ride bikes to school. And so it was always just like a big part of, part of my, part of like my family's life. My mom was really into bikes and really into being outdoors and stuff. So. Yeah. I think it definitely helped steer me in the right direction. Do you have an idol in the bike industry or maybe, or in the bike world and maybe an idol that's not? It, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard because now I'm like racing against all of them. And so like, I definitely think like, like Tim Johnson on the cross bike is so definitely someone I looked up to. He's raced in Europe, had a lot of success over there back when it was a lot, definitely a lot harder to go over and like is a good steward of like that knowledge and transferring it to younger riders and stuff. And so like he was super helpful when I was a kid and growing up and like helping us. He started the Mud Fund, which helped get me to Worlds one year. And hmm. he was always interested, at least when I was, when I was racing, I never, I only, I don't think I raced against him, but I think he retired before I was racing in the elites, but he was always there to, lend a helping hand and help, pre help with pre-rides at Worlds that he was going to and stuff. And so I've always respected people who not only are at a high level, but are help trying to help develop the next generation as well. And then, I don't know, it's weird, like, I don't... Soccer, any big soccer stars you love? Ronaldo or... I just watched the, I'm gonna be like, this is totally like jumping on the bandwagon, but me and my roommates just watched the uh, Jordan documentary. The Last Dance, I was asking you about that. Cool, that was insane. Yeah? I mean, yeah, I definitely admire the work ethic and like the like win at all costs like doesn't doesn't matter. I was actually that's a question for me because as I was driving up here today, I listened to Sports Talk. Yeah. And they were talking about how the all these NBA players yeah. who have been sitting around for the last couple of months and they watched Last Chance probably yeah. and how they're going to come back fired up, totally more focused. Do you, yeah. do you, are you going to take that to your next race, you think? It's hard because like we don't know when it is. Well, yeah. And so it's like, you can only do, like, it's hard to do, like, a lot of miles and stuff by yourself and stay motivated. So, like, it's, it's weird because, like, you don't want to be fit right now, but you want to be ready to be fit in a month. Why do you say that? I mean, because what? like, so you can't, you just can't sustain a high level of fitness for uh, forever, right? right? So, like, all, all, all seasons naturally have peaks and valleys. Right. And so... Like you wanna, like right now, at least I'm trying to, I'm just riding a lot, like doing 25 hour weeks-ish and just not a ton of intensity. Like I work with my coach Grant Holicky and it's like, all right, Max, you gotta do these intervals twice a week so that like once we have a date, we can like lay the groundwork. And so it's just like, it's weird because it doesn't feel like training because 
at least in Colorado and racing cross, I've never really had a true like base season where you just go out and ride because I'm racing till January sometimes and then picking up the road bike and racing in another month and a half. And so it's weird for me, at least like getting this base season in and just riding. So, but it's like, it doesn't feel like training as much because it's just, you're just going out and riding for four to five hours. Do you like training? I love it. Yeah. I definitely like, I definitely just love riding my bike and being outside and exploring new places and stuff. I have a love hate relationship right now with doing efforts, but <laughs> riding is fun. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you bang out a five, six hour day. It doesn't really matter what, how much Watts you're doing, like what your heart rate zone is, where you've been. It's like, it's, it all just adds up and it's money in the bank, you know? What's your impression as a professional? Like they talk about football players and basketball players who have lost the fun of what they do, but they still totally. do it well because they're pros. Yeah. Do you, do you see that in the Peloton too? Yeah. I mean, I think you can definitely like, I, I definitely experienced it myself and like have, it's hard because like, winning is fun right and like doing what going fast is fun but also like riding your bike is fun and like playing around with your friends is fun too so it's it's trying to strike that balance of like getting the hard work done that you need to not be miserable when you're racing but also not be miserable all the time when you're training for three months at a time so i feel like i have a a healthier balance with that because i i was racing in, at cu when i went to school and so have always been ready to like relax a little bit more off the bike. And as long as we're still like getting all the work done and stuff. But I think it's right now, it's definitely important. I think it's underrated how like the mental side of things is dealt with and how you can respond. Because I know for me personally, right? Like when I was in California for a month and a half, I was, I came out of that as fit as I'd ever been, fitter than I've ever been because I was just, it was nice out, it was warm weather. I had my gravel bike and I had my road bike and I was just going out every day and exploring new stuff, doing new intervals and new places to ride, new people to ride with, new, new adventures. And all of a sudden I came back. I, I looked at my training piece and I'd done four 25 hour weeks and a 35 hour week, like back to back to back to back. And I was like, all right, I'm ready for a break. But so it's like motivation, it makes it easy to train, right? Yeah. So if you can stay motivated and I think that's like, especially for like amateurs and stuff, like remembering that there's more to it than just being the fastest and like just banging out the intervals because you, your coach says so, right? Like maybe I'm not the best like athlete to be a advertising for coaching for, but <laughs> I was like, Grant, I don't feel like doing this today. Like I'm good. So, yeah. and I think it, it, it definitely is important. The more, I used to be a lot more like, all right, we just got to do the intervals, do it or not. And then after, it depends on, because after this road season, it was the longest road season I'd done. We raced from March to October, basically nonstop. And I was in China for a whole month, basically, and hadn't been home for more than a week at a time in four months. Mm. And I was like, I was mentally just beat. And, but I'm on a cross team. There's a month and a half left of cross racing. Grant's like, you gotta ride. And like, <laughs> dude, there's like, we got nationals, we got all these things. And so it was like, but I told him, I was like, I'm not riding if it's not with the group. Like we have a group of like me, Eric, Denzel, and Danny, some of the girls that race for Bitch Sticks and uh, the other people that Grant coaches around the area. And we just go out and find a park and rip around and make it fun. So like you can have fun while you're still getting a good workout in and stuff. So explain the blue stages team a little bit. Yeah. I mean, two local companies, blue bikes and stages, of course, mm -hmm. and you guys have a team. Is it a community team? Is it a, so it's just a, however you want to find like professional team. Like we all race at the, in the elite professional category as that team or part of other teams. And then you're, so for the cross, for the cross side of it, it's blue stages racing for cross time, okay. cross time. Uh, a little bit of gravel, not anymore, but for the cross season, it's, we're all racing the elite, the pro category. Okay. I'm racing in the pro field. Eric was in the U23 category, but for the most part, you all race together. And so, yeah, it was, uh, when, when I came out of the juniors, it was, I was on Cliff Bar at the time. And one of the guys who was running the Cliff Bar team decided he wanted to start a U23 team. And that was the pros closet. 
uh, and it was me and two of my good buddies from growing up, and we were racing. And then he decided to move on, and we started. We like transferred the team to Evil Burritos, oh, right. which was a long-standing like Josh Whitney, Spencer Pallison, and Grant. I'm sure I'm forgetting some people, but had that team going. They yep. wanted to bring on a like a younger rider to help develop, and it was just a natural fit of merging the two programs and continuing to sport two under 23s while also having these masters. And then as those guys started to phase out their racing careers a little more, it was like, all right, let's switch this to a under 23 team. And which is what me and my buddy Ian McPherson and uh, Eric Bruner were at the time. And then evil got bought and, you know, we were super thankful for the five years that they had given us and, but it was time to move on. And, we kind of wanted to take a little more control and not have people telling us, you got to do this, you got to do that, like hiding the budget. And, you know, there was really no other option between before, other than like Eric and I basically running the team. And mm. so started an LLC. And what's the 19 year old Max like compared to the 24 year old? Oh my gosh, so impulsive and rash. Like, I, I feel like I, it's been, cycling's given me a lot, but I think a lot of it was like, having to grow up and mature a lot quicker because you know you're traveling to foreign countries by yourself you're you, you got sponsors you got, got sponsors that you got to give back to and like you can you know you can't just be like a co normal college student posting shit on the internet <laughs> you like going to house parties and all this crap and you know you watch you your twitter feed a little bit exactly right? <laughs> right and so it's like you know trying to cultivate a little more of like a professional attitude around the internet and how I interact and stuff. And, and I was coaching with BJC at the time. And so, um, like being professional for that and all that stuff. And so I feel like I definitely had grown up a lot, I, but I've always been very like get shit done and taking like, know that like these are the important things and the rest can, doesn't really matter what happens as much. What was your degree at CU? Uh, economics with a math minor. Okay. So. What do you maybe hope to do with that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> maybe like grad are. school. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know what I'd be doing this when I was at totally, CSU, right? right? But uh, and what? like, it was more like I didn't. I wasn't a great junior. Like, I was a good junior on the cross bike, but there's no, there was no like real jobs to get in the cross scene afterwards. Yeah. Like, no one was really making money, and you're like living off of prize winnings basically if you're racing cross at that time at my age, and like some kids had. Some kids were signed with professional teams, but there was, I think there's maybe like two spots or something. And so, you know, it was never a question of like, if I'm going to go to college or if I'm going to race bikes, it was always like, where am I going to go to college? And yeah. it was like, I didn't apply to anywhere other than CU and I applied the last possible day and got in in like 20 days. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, I'm going to see you. I love Boulder. I love riding here and I got a great community around and supporting me. And so it was just a natural, easy transition. And then. I was in the business school because my like grades in high school were good, and so they were like, "Here, you're in the business school now." And I found out that I hated the business school, <laughs> and I hated like, because I just 19 year old Matt just wanted to race bikes. Like that was it. Like it was like I don't care what. Like I need a job during the summer, but it's like, hey, I'm gonna be. You, I can't come in till the till like three because I'm riding in the morning. I'm gonna take <laughs> I'm gonna take this Friday off because I gotta go to this bike race and I'm gonna be gone for a week. But like, so it's always been like people that I know that like know me and trust me and stuff that they're yeah. like, yeah, I mean, I guess you could like my buddy Freeberg hired me at his chicken shack, like the at yellow belly. Oh, and I was like, yeah, I can't work weekends. He's like, I mean, you gotta give him like, he's a friend, like give him a job. <laughs> and so been literally lucky with that. But yeah, just 19 year old Max is definitely like all about, it was like bike racing is number one the rest will figure it out. And yeah. I think that still to this day, still it's like, bike racing is a priority, high priority, and the rest is works around it. And I'm lucky enough to be in a position that I'm making money racing bikes and the things I do outside of it are flexible enough that I can take off here and take off in the middle of the day and go ride for six yeah. hours. And so. How about the 24 year old Max talking to the 40 year old Max? Ugh. What do you think is going to be that? What was 40 year old Max going to be we'll like? We'll see because so the older I get, the more I'm realizing that you need money to do stuff. <laughs> and so you can't just like mess around and ride bikes all the time. Right. But I would like to, I would hope that I don't like sell out, not sell out, but like go get some office job and 
be cooped up all the time. Work in the bike industry? Do you see that? Yeah, like, I love the bike industry. I love coaching. I don't, I don't, I just like being outside and being able to do, I just like having the freedom to do different things and yeah. like different priorities and stuff. And right now it's just like trying to be young and gather some experiences so that when I am 30, when I am 40, I maybe know what I want to do a little yeah. more and like maybe have kids yeah. family we'll, uh, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> that seems like a lot right now I know right yeah for like I mean yeah I'm right now it's just like trying to have fun take advantage of like you know I'm only gonna be 24 I'm only getting older right so it's like I'm not gonna be able to do all this stuff forever and yeah so just enjoy it while it lasts and try to make it last as long as possible that's good you know well let me uh, let me let me switch on you a little bit okay what um what's some of your favorite local rides oh favorite local rides right now i'm all i am just all into doing it's weird because with the i feel like i've done the same ride every day for the last two months even though i'm doing different roads it's like i live in south boulder and so we go cherryvale out to 75th to like hygiene and then you go to the hills oh yeah and so i've been doing i did uh, on my birthday, I went and rode to, uh, where is it? Old uh, Big Thompson, yeah. out, out past Carter Lake, up to Estes, right. and then back. And it was super beautiful. I love going up to Estes right now. Or uh, I'm trying to connect all these cross trails together on a gravel bike, but we'll see how that works. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard right now with all the construction and stuff, but I've been enjoying the Swiss Trail and just trying to get like, now that all the cars are back on the road, there's so many good dirt options in the mountains that are underrated and people are afraid to ride the road bikes on and stuff. And so just trying to get up, up high as much as possible. And Do you do anything with your team, like in terms of do you guys so get together much? The wildlife generation team, everyone lives in different places. So I'm the only one in Colorado. There's another kid who lives in Vail, but. Okay. How big is that far. team? Uh, we have nine riders. Okay. Spread out mostly on the West Coast. But some in Kansas, some in Fayetteville. So, but Eric and I will usually go out and go do something stupid every once in a while, and go do because it's it's fun to it's fun to go take cross and gravel bikes out with people who are like really strong riders, and just go rip mountain bike trails. Like mm. Eric and I, before the whole safer at home thing, we went and ripped Potasso and on our gravel bikes oh, and stuff. And yeah. so it's fun to go out and do stuff with that like that with him because we both are really competent riders and so you can really push the limits a little more. And you're in the bike industry working for the hat that you have. For WTB, yeah. Yep. And what do you do with them? I'm a OEM sales coordinator. So I help place orders, facilitate like new part numbers and stuff. And is that, that's a local, local distribution? They're in California, but the head of the OEM sales lives in Boulder too and been friends with him for a long time. Oh, nice. So yeah, no, it's worked out well and it's nice to be able to work remote because you can kind of set your own schedule a little bit. And, you know, as long as everything gets done at the end of the day, it's okay. Yeah. And you so, can ride bikes. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's like a, you know, it's nice because when people trust you to do, like trust you to work remote and trust you that like, you know, you have this job that people are counting on you to do things, but you're also trying to race bikes and stuff. It's like, I feel like there's added pressure to do both well because you don't like I've done the whole work at the bike shop work at a restaurant and it sucks frankly (laughs) like I love I love it but like being on your feet all the time and trying to race full time it's very difficult so it's like and I've been in that position after I graduated I was working at I was working at full cycle at the time and I was working for different places and I feel very fortunate to be in the position that I am and so it's like working hard to protect that position you know yeah so well, let me uh, just wrap up with three of our standard questions we ask okay. all our guests. And tell me, tell me some whys, of course. What so far in 2020 has been your best decision and why? Going to California was definitely the best decision. Just like met, met so many new people, met so many great people and experienced so many different things before like, I feel like it's, I feel like, can I answer it in two parts? Right? Sure. Cause like, There's 2020 before March, right? Where it was like normal 2020, and now it's like after that, it's like now what? Yeah. And so I feel like before that, like going to California, and I've never really I was alone. I was on a road trip alone, and I hate driving, and I hate. I'm a super social person and love talking to people and stuff, and 
So it was definitely intimidating to get out of my comfort zone and be driving for so long by myself mm -hmm. and yeah. going to new places and sort of being more or less alone for a long time. And like I was seeing, I have a lot of friends all over, but I was staying with, and so it was definitely like a good experience and got a lot of fun riding in and met a lot of new awesome people. And then I think like now since the pandemic hit, like reading more and like getting away from everything and like going into the mountains and like going camping and stuff and just taking a break from social media and posting and riding and doing the exact, all the same things that just become so monotonous over time when we can't do the things that we're used to has been very helpful, I feel mm. like. So. Interesting, that makes sense. Well, how about this? Where, if you could go any place in the world, what's your favorite place to go? Oh, I absolutely love Europe, but to visit, I, I think, I really want to go back to Europe and like, I love Belgium, I love France, that area. And I just think the culture's great. You're like riding bikes everywhere. I love commuting by bike and how easily accessible it is. And I really like bread, which yeah. is like, it's so much better over there. And it just like, doesn't make sense. And so I think I would move to Europe because like the bread's so much better. <laughs> like I stand by that. Quote of the day. Yeah. Bread is better in Europe. That's... It's so much better. And it's <laughs> super cheap and like delicious and you can have it for every meal. And wine's super cheap. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm, st I'm still only 24, so I'm not that into wine yet, <laughs> but that's what I've heard. Um, so our last question is what did, this is going to be an interesting one for you. You're, you're our youngest guest so far. You're the youngest guest. So you yeah. haven't had a career that you would look back and say, oh, gosh, I would do something totally different maybe. But maybe the question is, what would be your dream career if you're not doing what you're doing? Yeah. So maybe what would be, if it's not biking, what maybe there was another path you might have chosen that you kind of wish you'd maybe explored. Yeah. It's weird because I feel like I, like, like you said, I am pretty young and I don't, I feel like I could quit and do something else tomorrow right. and would be and would be fine. But I think definitely it's weird because I have these two conflicting sides inside where it's like I want to go race bikes and I want to go be in the woods. But I also am like super interested in behavioral economics huh. and love trying to figure out how to like get people to do stuff with incentives and stuff. And so I think the parallel career would either be economic like a PhD in economics or something what to do with bike advocacy and things like that, which is something that I've become more passionate about. And I think I got on the board of BJC now and I've, I grew up through BJC and was coaching for them for four years and now have a seat on the board. And I think that like just the opportunities that that has provided to kids and like getting a young, other young kids involved in bikes and becoming lifelong athletes and stuff is something that now that I'm seeing the other side of it a little more. I am very thankful that I had those opportunities as a kid. And so that's good, something that I would definitely strongly consider pursuing is helping young kids get on bikes, especially in areas like we're super lucky in Boulder because right. we have BJC and all these trail systems and tons of people to coach you and stuff. But you know, you look at other areas and stuff and it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. And like Nike is doing a great job now and all those other programs and Durango Devo and things like that. But just wherever I end up, just trying to remember to give back to the junior scene because that's what it's all about. All right. So cool. Well, hey, thanks for being a guest on totally. Talk and uh, look forward to some rides with you. Yeah, should be fun. 